So this portion of the notes um, is moving on from photosynthesis, and we're going to talk about something that we've mentioned before in this class, chemosynthesis, that occurs in these deep ocean areas, these black smokers, otherwise known as hydrothermal vents. They're also called brine seeps and asphalt seeps. Um, and uh, similar places like that. There's a few other names as well, but these are, these, and these are some of the things we have to talk about. So, describe chemosynthesis. This is it. That describes it in form of the reactants and the products. Now you have a question. Don't copy this one down. There's no place in your notes to copy this. Why? Because you already have it in the last set of notes that we did. So, as um, a reminder and as a, some uh, embellishment of these notes, okay, I'm going to stop after you uh, write these down. I'll give you another you know, minute to write these down very well. Make sure you're copying them very well, getting all the symbols correct. Make sure that these are uppercase you know, numbers and these are subscripts. So these are your coefficients and these are your subscripts. Make sure you get it all correct. Know that this is hydrogen sulfide, and we know what carbon dioxide and glucose are, water, and then sulfur. And there's a question about the difference between chemosynthesis and photosynthesis in their ultimate goal. Like, you know, so the, the question is worded properly not what's coming out of my mouth right now, um, in your notes. So make sure that you are working on that as well, because um, I'm going to stop this. Saved by the bell. I'm going to stop this, and then we're going to watch a uh, video in class, and then I'm going to restart the notes after we watch the video, okay? All right, so that short little video should have been kind of eye-opening. Um, we didn't see too much video. Maybe we saw some animations last time with our, um, you know, first introduction of hydrothermal vents and that ecosystem when we were talking about different kinds of ecosystems and different kinds of um, food chains and things like that. But here is a food web, and you have to use this. I put this in your notes. You're going to choose, well, obviously this is going to be the same for every single, for, of the two food chains that you have to create in your notes. You're going to start with simple chemicals and you're going to choose a producer, choose a primary consumer, choose a secondary consumer and a top consumer, and you're going to choose whatever ones you want. Make sure that they flow, they're connected, um, and um, you make two good food chains, okay? You can do that later. All right, so what, is, what, what are these, these giant four to six foot, so that's like, you know, from here to here, tube worms that form the base of the food chain along with their symbiotic bacteria. So these are called foundation um, organisms, meaning that they build the environment for everything else to come and live. The, it's, you've heard of terms like keystone, predator or keystone um, uh, you know, organism, keystone species, or top predator. Well, this is a foundational species. And they're called Riftia. Riftia, that's their genus. And it's these two worms um, that have endoriftia. Endo means inside, right? So they named the bacteria that only exists inside Riftia, um, endoriftia. And they live inside the trophosome, which is this internal region. They don't have a stomach, okay? Um, they just have this internal region. And you can see they have um, vents, vessels. Uh, the heart is right there. So, and these are their gills. So the gas exchange occurs here. They bring all these gases in. 
then the bacteria, the endoriftia, convert these products into food for the worm. And the worm provides food for the bacteria. It's a symbiotic, mutualistic, they're not parasitic bacteria, they're not commensalistic, where one benefits and the other is neither harmed nor benefited. They're mutualistic, they're helping each other, right? One cannot exist without the other. That's how mutualistic they are. I mean, it's the same with us. We have bacteria that live inside our gut that if you were to remove them all, you would no longer be able to digest your food and you would die. Whoa, it's like our brother right here, okay? Um, so it's very interesting how all of this relates. And so um, they produce glucose and the other organic molecules like amino acids, and then they get that constant supply of, um, from the hydrothermal vent of the hydrogen sulfide for chemosynthesis. And this is how, you have, to you have to explain this in your notes, you have to explain how, based upon this diagram, the, how the symbionts infect the Riftia, the adult Riftia. How do they get in there in the first place? Well, this kind of explains it. This is the embryo, and then it's a trochophore larva, and then a larva that settles down in a habitable place. But it's that stage right there, the settling larva, that the infection occurs, and then symbiosis occurs between these two stages. And then when the organism dies, it releases symbionts back into new ones, you know, not the original ones, not these. Um, ones that have reproduced generation after generation, right? When it dies, it releases them back and, and the cycle starts all over again. Really cool. And the last part of our notes, we're going to discuss uh, respiration, which is, we know, the opposite of photosynthesis. And we've talked a lot about respiration in fish and with the fish gills and, you know, ram ventilation and pump ventilation and spiracles and the sharks that sit on the bottom like nurse sharks and, and absorption through uh, the tissues of um, corals, for example. So we're not going to go too deeply into that. Just going to do a comparison. All right. So and, and I have pictured here some interesting creatures. Uh, this one doesn't live here. This is kelp, so it must be in the Pacific coast. We know that kelp does not grow in Florida. Um, that's a seven gill shark. Most sharks have five gills. Then there's the six gill shark, that's a deep water shark. Then there's this cow shark or broad nosed shark called a seven gill shark. And yes, that's one word, seven gill. And then here's a tarpon. Tarpon are right here in Florida. Here, I guess this guy's in a boat and he probably caught it and he's just releasing it back into the water again. Um, but they are pretty, pretty immense uh, predators around the waters. They won't hurt you. Um, they're less dangerous than barracuda. All right, so we, the main difference in, in the respiration in this part of the notes is the difference between um, aerobic and anaerobic respiration. And Energy is released from glucose, right? Producing carbon dioxide and water as the waste products. It's just taking that photosynthesis arrow and flipping it over 180. And that's the same exact general equation. So it uses oxygen. It's aerobic, just like aerobic exercise. And then energy is released. You need, you need ATP. So, and it happens, it starts in the cytoplasm, but continues in those mitochondria, those powerhouses of the cell, which we're so familiar with. So more active fish are going to have more uh, mitochondria in their muscles to produce that ATP. And then one molecule, one molecule of glucose produces, I know it's hard to see, but that's 38 ATP molecules. One molecule, you should have learned that in biology class last semester if you were in biology this year, um, but it's a first semester thing. 
one molecule makes 38. So the, the, I'm, I'm reiterating that so that you can see the difference between aerobic and anaerobic on the next. Um, and, then, and then we use that ATP, we break that bond, that's the energy storing bond right there. And then it becomes ADP, diphosphate, and then we know the process in plants anyway that reconnects that phosphate back. And so this is the formula for um, respiration. See, you just take this arrow and turn it around and now it's pho uh, photosynthesis and then flip back. And so we all know that, pretty simple. That's something that you just have to memorize as a science student. So the levels of ATP do not change very much, even if cells like the muscle cells of a fish are using a lot of ATP because they, they just re respire at a faster rate to create more and regulate and, and regenerate, regulate the numbers of those ATP molecules so that there's a constant supply. Now, of course, if the fish stops eating and stops getting its energy source, glucose, the ATP production will decrease and it will get weak and then eventually will die. It will starve to death, right? That's what starvation is. Or if it's oxygen deprived. So if you remove any one of the supp incoming supplies, one of the reactants, you're going to stop making the products and stop making ATP. And then you, it's a downward spiral from there. Okay. And this is our last slide. Slide 31, um, you're going to have to answer some questions in your notes about this after we're done. So I'm not going to go too far into this, but this is just the opposite of aerobic. This is anaerobic. Anaerobic. Anytime you put the suffix a or an in front of a word, it negates it. It makes it the opposite, right? So without oxygen. Anaerobic is without oxygen. If you know anything about sports or sports injuries or cramping, or if you ever get a stitch in your side from running or doing exercise, you know that that is um, cramps in your muscles are from lactic acid buildup. And that's what happens when you have incomplete combustion of glucose. And it only makes two molecules of ATP this way. So you will continue to be able to move and function, but compare that with the 38 in aerobic, it's gonna be, um, you can't live this way. This is a temporary situation for survival purposes um, when your oxygen levels are depleted. Um, and this occurs in the cytoplasm, not in the mitochondria. So um, you can see that dissolved oxygen levels and then the minimum amounts needed by certain different species. So clams require less than these fishes, crabs even more, but there are some species of fish that, that can live in even lower oxygen levels, milligrams per liter. Okay, and then you've got worms in the um, substrate in the fauna, right? Fauna means animals, flora means plants, in means in. So there are animals living in the substrate, in fauna. And that is our second part of our notes. So I'm going to give you the rest of the period to go back over the entire set of notes and uh, complete all of those parts um, that we have to do. Okay?